the year 1966. The U.S. announces it will substantially increase its number of troops in Vietnam. President Lyndon Johnson and Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. meet at the White House, and the Beatles play their last concert at Candlestick Park. It's also the year a dozen California State University students arrive in Florence, Italy to start a new study abroad program. That's Ed. Hi, Ed. Go ahead. Hey, hello, everybody. This is so fun to see everybody. It really is. When I set my foot down in Italy, I felt like I was home. Every, every little corner of that city is something incredibly historic and I, I just couldn't get over that. Uh, uh, grew up on a, a little farm in rural uh, uh, California. The first time I was out of the country. And, uh, it, was, uh, it was just an amazing experience that uh, really transformed my life. They settled into independent living arrangements, just like today's CSU Florence students. We weren't in on a campus, which I think was the best thing that ever happened to us, mm -hmm. because we all became very independent. We learned our Italian better. Denise and I were in a pension where other rooms were rented out, and some to young Italian students. Uh, Dennis and I and Bill DiNardo were um, housed in the home of a contessa. I can't remember her last name. You? Carducci. Contessa Carducci. That was it. And the family, the young family that I lived with part of the time had a baby while I was living there. And I got to be the godmother. The students often gathered at the cottage rented by Sherry and Bill Maybeck, a couple who'd been married just days before arriving in Florence. And God bless you all, because I'll tell you, without, without the foundation of all of you, you really are my family. Bill, Bill, it's because of you and Sherry that we're close yeah. to, because we met at your house. We partied at your house. But the class of 66 would face challenges. When I think about what we lived through with that, it was, it was, I, I don't even know the word, it was historic. But for us, it was um, character making. On November 4th, Florence's Arno River spilled over its banks. I mean, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't believe it was happening. I mean, I really didn't believe it. The worst flood in nearly 400 years. Total confusion. The Italians running around screaming and yelling, especially the, the ones that were in the higher levels on the upper floors. Oh, we got there. We got as far as Castle San Michael, and that was it. Via Cavour was a river. The statue of a Madonna that just slid across was at Santa Maria del Fiore. She just went from one end to the other. It's the doors on the baptistry. You're, you're totally the panels were floating in the water. So, you know, I mean, it's awful. And it was a mess. And I, get, I still get emotional thinking about it. I lived in a three-story house. The first floor was gutted. There was 20 feet of water where I lived. More than 100 people perished as thousands of homes and businesses were destroyed. There was just poor little, all these poor little nuns trying to scrape whatever they could and salvage whatever they could. So I joined in and helped them. You know, they gave you like a shovel or something. In fact, the photo in the, in, the, uh, in, in the newspaper shows us we're shoveling. We've got shovels and rakes in our hands. And just shovel all the stuff, the mud, whatever it is. But, I mean, there was everything in the mud. Salami, shoes. And I helped clean up the library. I did the mud. We did, too. We did I, too. I was there at the library, too. The, the yes. Nationale. Not only mud, but it was full of kerosene because everyone used kerosene for their heating. At most of these places, basements and you know lower floors already had stocked up kerosene for the winter. And so that also got all out in the water. And so it was this oily stuff. The, the mud was all oily and it had you know, spotted all the books. Government, government documents, they were in these big books and there was a huge long line 
and we were just doing it, you know, handing it over, handing it over, handing it over. And uh, people came from other places in the EU, or maybe other, you know, other countries, and they had just all come down to help out. This band of international volunteers became known as the Angeli del Fango, the Mud Angels. You know, we were touching history that we had read about, but now we were touching it, and it was sent to different places to be dried and restored. When we went back to the Pensioni, um, the, um, you remember her? What was her name? La Signorina. <laughs> we called her La Signorina. Oh, yeah, well, Signorina. I can't remember her last name now. But anyway, she um, she had us drink. Do you remember this? We had to drink a big bicchiere di, um, you know, cognac or some grappa or something because she thought that would kill the germs and we weren't allowed in. She was not happy that we were out there you know, working at the a mud. certain point, she told us we couldn't go out and volunteer anymore. She didn't. She was afraid <laughs> of us getting malaria or something. I don't know. And do you all remember they didn't have running water for a while? We were yeah. given a pot, uh, you know, like a real pot about yay big and we were we the truck would come by the water truck and we'd have to run down there wait in line we stood in line to get the water that lasted a week maybe two weeks whatever but there was no bathing it became a university community state national effort uh, to raise funds specifically for the children. At Christmas time, uh, we did a little thing, because I remember I was the Bafana. We went to an orphanage, and we gave gifts, and you were the Bafana, yes. Yeah, we had a good time <laughs> doing it. It felt good. The rest of the year, they traveled and met Italian relatives. So I met my grandparents for the first time. It's really a satisfying and uh, wonderful way to connect back to my heritage. They were just so warm, and I, I felt like, you know, I belonged, and it was wonderful. And I even brought uh, Denise with me one time, and we stayed. Yeah. <laughs> That's a whole other story. We won't go into <laughs> To be continued at maybe yet another reunion, because they all agree that 1966 was the beginning of a lot of good things. I felt very much like home, and I have always felt that way in Italy. In fact, we're going next year if, if things, you know, improve. I can't think of any experience more enriching than to study abroad. There are so many things that happened to me that would never have happened otherwise. It altered my life, broadened my perspectives. And I think it's always stood by me and been like um, a little jewel in my crown that helped me to get other jobs. I, I feel very grateful. That was the best thing I could have ever done. That's all I can say for my future. It was a joyful year. I think that it was life changing and left a positive impression for the rest of our lives. I could never have done what I did in the business world if I didn't have that background. And we traveled extensively, and it just opened up such a love of travel. Surprisingly, I mean, that was the last thing that I would have ever thought of, you know, before coming over here. Uh, from the time that I was in Florence, uh, I've encouraged students to uh, participate and participate myself. The lasting impact that the program has given me. I know that I'm highly adaptable. That's why. I I could succeed in Alaska, but when you ask someone what's the impact the year had for you, I always go back to something my dad taught me, because we all had generalities. Yes, we went through the flood, we helped people, 
we like to see the young children smile, but it's also on a personal level. And my dad always taught me, if you want to know the importance of something, imagine your life without it. So for all of us who were there that first year, all we have to do is imagine our life without it. And then you realize what a, what a priceless gift we had.